This is Heidi Burgess. This is the second of two videos in which I talk about what I call retrospective reconciliation. This refers to the processes that are used to look back in time to past wrongs, trying to determine the truth about what happened and provide justice for the victims and the perpetrators of those wrongs. I ended the last video with this slide saying that Chip House quotes Desmond Tutu as saying reconciliation isn't cozy. Chip went on to say it doesn't come quickly or easily. Indeed, achieving anything like reconciliation normally takes years or even decades. And in a country like the United States, whose racism is etched into its entire history, the first signs of reconciliation will also have to be constantly reinforced and nurtured if we want to have the chance to survive the challenges and setbacks that we will inevitably encounter along the way. Let's talk about the challenges for a moment. First is the one I talked about earlier, that many people who, at, le at least today, have no interest in reconciliation. They're angry. They're afraid. They distrust the other side. They think that their conciliatory gestures, if they make ones, will be seen as tricks or traps, and that any reciprocation will just lead to a double cross. They have no respect for the other. They maybe even see them as non-human. But people can and do change. This picture was taken from an NBC News story about a documentary called Accidental Courtesy, Daryl Davis, Race and America. Daryl Davis is a black mus musician who happened to meet a member of the Ku Klux Klan after one of his concerts. According to the NBC reporter Adam Howard, Davis began his crusade by asking himself the existential question, how can you hate me when you don't even know me? Davis began to reach out to members of hate groups, and he found that the more willing he was to hear them out, the more open they became to embracing him. More than two dozen white supremacists have since renounced their ideology of hate, in part because Davis's peace offering. This is one such story, but I've read many others just like it. Daryl Davis reaches out on his own. But more often, people need help. Dialogues are one way to get people to better understand and perhaps eventually work with others. This picture and text is taken from one of Essential Partners' impact stories. This story is about a number of religious leaders and political leaders in Maryland who were all concerned about the unraveling of the social fabric and they met together to talk about how they might start to heal their diverse community. They proposed bringing different religious groups together in dialogue. For us to heal the fissures in our community, we needed to learn how to connect across differences, listen to one another, and understand one another more profoundly. That was said by Dr. Reverend Turner. We have to repair the broken trust that makes a community and a democracy possible. Using a train the trainer model, this project has now engaged more than 500 residents in healthy, open, honest dialogue about their experiences of racism and religious bias. People of all faiths and races have talked about what connects and what holds them apart. They shared how they wanted to be understood and what they wanted to understand about each other. They talked about their convictions, their hopes, and fears. John Seraph, who is executive director of Essential Partners, observed of this effort, One of our mantras at Essential Partners is that community is an act of courage. And it is our honor to stand alongside dedicated volunteers who are living out this courage. Another way to get reluctant people to reconcile is to bring them together for purposes other than reconciliation, so that they can figure out on their own that the other side doesn't have horns. This be can be done by what we call on Beyond Intractability, joint projects. 
One of our grad students in 2003 wrote this article for BI on joint projects, and to my surprise, when I went to Google to find some newer examples, all that I came up with was this article and some related things on BI. I'm sure I could have done better if I came up with other search terms, but I didn't. In that original article, Chris Morin, the author, cited a bilingual uh, school in Galilee for Arab and Jewish children in which all classes are taught by an Arab and a Jew, a Philippine bakery that employs Muslims and Christians, a project to rebuild Albanian mosques in Kosovo by Jews, Protestants, Serb Orthodox, and Albanian Muslims, and finally the JAMA project in Burundi which encourages soccer games with teams composed of both Hutus and Tutsis. And, Chris pointed out, some people even consider the European Union to be a kind of joint project, since it came about following the Cold War and has served as a gal galvanizing focus for former enemies to work together in many different domains. Other examples are not work, but play. One of my former SCAR students wrote a beautiful case study entitled The Power of Music and Dance to Heal War-Torn Societies, Case Studies from Brazil, Uganda, and Israel-Palestine. Other people have written about the use of sports to bring people together to establish the trust and relationships that are needed to start a reconciliation process. I will list several of these articles in the reference area. Changing gears, I took this slide from our earlier retrospective reconciliation slideshow. In that, Guy pointed out that one of the things that affects how one approaches retrospective reconciliation is the nature of the conflict and the wrongs that are in need of reconciling. Guy made this chart which suggests that there are two variables that are particularly important. First is the question of whether the wrongs are committed in the past, as in slavery or apartheid or Cambodia's killing fields, for instance, or whether they are contemporary or ongoing. Now, Guy showed this as a dichotomy, but it isn't really. That's because many people believe that current day systemic racism against blacks in the U.S. is a direct outgrowth of slavery. The same could be argued about apartheid. The government program separating out blacks and discriminating against them is over, but the socioeconomic disparities in South Africa still run very deep. Guy asserts that this distinction is important because he thinks it's easier to sell compensation for contemporary wrongs than it is for past wrongs. Progressive income tax, for instance, is a well-established, if recently crippled, version of redistribution redistribution of wealth from the rich to the poor. All the poverty assistance programs and affirmative action programs are designed to remedy current wrongs more than past ones. And while these programs have been controversial and cut back substantially during most Republican administrations, they are still not nearly as controversial as are reparations for slavery or for stealing Native Americans' lands. The other dimension is whether one is looking at wrongs perpetrated by the current day winners or current day losers, or whether the conflict is ongoing so that there isn't a designated winner or loser yet. Wrongs perpetrated by winners are usually versions of oppression. Addressing these wrongs is made difficult by the fact that the winners, the perpetrators, often see their behavior as not wrong at all. They may see it as fair as they won a power contest to attain their victorious position, or they may see it as fair because they think they worked harder or were in some way superior to the losers who they believe deserve their fate. Though such attitudes make reconciliation more difficult, it can be done. In the 1960s, the civil rights movement in the U.S. convinced a lot of white people that black oppression was indeed immoral and that the change of attitudes paved the way for the 1964 Civil Rights Act and the 1965 Voting Rights Act. Certainly that wasn't all that was needed to accomplish justice or reconciliation, but it was a good start. 
Then you have other wrongs that tend to be perpetrated by the losers or the less powerful. Violence, for example, that is perpetrated by the disempowered who feel that they have no other way to get their voices heard. Should these crimes be dealt with the same way as wrongs perpetrated by the winners? I won't answer that question. I'll let you think about it. Still, Guy noted, history tends to be written by the victors, and they tend to assume that the losers are responsible for their own fate. That's why there's such an uproar over historical narratives, and that tends to drive what we do with respect to these wrongs. The New York Times started the 1619 Project that, in their words, aims to reframe the country's history by placing the consequences of slavery and the contributions of black Americans at the very center of our national narrative. In response, Trump started his own 1776 Commission to take what he called a, an historic and scholarly step to restore understanding of the greatness of America's founding. A lot of people uh, dispute that notion that this was historic and scholarly, but I won't get into that argument here. What I do want to point out is that the battle between these two narratives is likely to be intense, and it's been played out locally as protesters pull down statues to the Founding Fathers, to Southern Civil War leaders, and to others seen by the current progressive narrative to be monuments to past wrongs. And similar conflicts are being played out in countless school board meetings around the country as history and civics textbooks are chosen. How we paint and teach our children about history will have a great deal of impact on how and if these conflicts are reconciled. Another important dimension is whether reconciliation is being pursued after the conclusive defeat of one side or whether the situation is more ambiguous. The picture on the left is a picture of the official document signing where the Japanese surrendered after World War II. I use this because I couldn't find an equivalent for the German surrender. But in both cases, the end of the conflict was agreed upon by both sides, and in the case of World War II, the U.S. and Allies went out of their way to help the defeated powers recover from the war with the Marshall Plan in Europe and an equivalent reconstruction plan in Japan. This was far different than the Treaty of Versailles that ended World War I, which is widely seen as so punitive as to lead to the, lead to the rise of Hitler, Nazism, and World War II. It seems to me that there's a lesson there in terms of the utility of punitive reparations. We ought to think about this as we consider reparations for slavery. Yes, blacks were wronged by whites, just as the Allies were wronged by the center powers in World War I. That's Germany, Austria, Hungary, Italy, the Ottoman Empire. But the harsh reparations forced on Germany led directly to World War II. Having learned that lesson, George Marshall convinced the victorious Allies to help rather than hurt the Axis powers after World War II which led to a strong alliance between the U.S., the EU, and Japan, instead of leading to World War III. Dealing with grievous wrongs when the conflict continues, or when, as in the United States, the wrongs are, wrongdoers are still in power, is more complicated. Gaia suggested that it would make sense to have some sort of Truth and Reconciliation Commission in which the stories of U.S. involvement in Iraq and Afghanistan could come out, much in the same way they came out in South Africa. If we did that, it would be good if the United States could assume responsibility for the terrible things that it did in those two countries. And others could likewise take responsibility. Given that a peace treaty has been signed with the Taliban, that doesn't seem entirely far-fetched. In Iraq, which is now controlled by the Shia with close ties to Iran, and other areas controlled by ISIS, that seems like much more of a long shot. It is, of course, being considered in the U.S., both in cities and nationally, with U.S. truth, racial healing, and transformation movement, 
which aims to work with the Biden administration to establish a U.S. Commission on Truth, Racial Healing, and Transformation within their first hundred days in office. Aside from the Truth Commissions, other countries have used forgiveness and reintegration rit rituals to reintegrate former combatants or perpetrators, including child soldiers, back into their communities. Another moving documentary, Fom Bull Took, uh, is available on Amazon. Unfortunately, it's no longer streaming. You have to buy it. And it tells about the traditional Fambul Tuk process used to reconcile perpetrators and victims in Sierra Leone's civil war. This video is getting long too, so I'll stop here by noting that none of this is easy and it certainly isn't quick. But Boulding's first law, if it exists it must be possible, applies again. Retrospective reconciliation has been done successfully before, even in extremely challenging circumstances, such as South Africa, Rwanda, and Sierra Leone. So it can be done successfully again. We just need to plan the strategy carefully, learn from the past and other countries' experiences, work with all the stakeholders, perpetrators and victims, government and civil society, to develop a process that people will trust, participate in, and will see as legitimate. If you have that and you have the resources and the commitment to really carry it out, you can have a powerful effect on reconciliation, peace, and conflict transformation.